The Gurning Man of Glasgow. On a moonlit night in the Cross Hill area of Glasgow, two young friends walking home noticed a strange figure in the distance. A bald, middle-aged man, clad in a skin-tight black leotard, contorting his body and grunting maniacally, appeared near a streetlight. The girls picked up their pace in fear and passed by, but when one of them looked back over her shoulder, the thin figure had vanished into the darkness. This was just one of 17 sightings made in Cross Hill between 1976 and 1979 of what became known as the Gurning Man of Glasgow. He was only seen by women between the hours of 9 p.m. and 4 a.m. He was described by witnesses as a man in his 50s, skinny and bald. He appeared in tight black clothing in most reports, sometimes with a leotard, others in a black suit. When he was spotted, he would make horrible faces that on occasions resembled a grotesque smile accompanied by grunting noises and heavy breathing. After some erratic movements typical of a demented soul, he would suddenly vanish into thin air after people blinked or turned elsewhere. Most of his sightings were in streets or quiet parks from the locale, but some happened inside houses. In the middle of the night, the mother awoke to the sound of grunting. At first she thought it was her husband, but he was sleeping quietly next to her. She turned around to find the source of the violent sounds. In the darkness beyond her bed, she spotted a strange form. She was petrified. To her horror, a strange man at the end of her bed, scraping ferociously at his chest, was staring at her with a sinister and twisted grin on his face. She screamed as if her life depended on it. The husband woke up at that instant and rushed to the light switch. When the light banished the darkness of the room, the gurning man was nowhere to be seen. After the last apparition of the Gurning Man in 1979, peace returned to Glasgow for decades, but in 2017, he was reportedly seen again. A woman living in the Queen's Park area was heading home in the middle of the night when a spindly old man approached her. He appeared much older, likely in his 80s. Wearing tight black clothes and making disturbing noises, the man moved with a strange mechanical pace. She ran, and after glancing back, the old man had vanished between two parked cars. The Child of the Wild. In 1987, a bedraggled boy aged about five was discovered by Sundumbili residents, showing strange animal like behavior. Locals said that he was spotted roaming alongside packs of monkeys scavenging for fruit thrown by people in the vicinity. He attracted attention for his strange animal behavior. He ran and walked with his four limbs like an ape. He liked climbing trees and onto rooftops. He loved fruit, especially bananas. When he was taken to civilization, he was astonished by cars, bicycles, and people. At the police station, officers were unable to make him speak. The boy behaved like a real monkey. He was only able to grunt and shout. Officers tried to identify him and his family, but it was futile. He was then put in the care of the Ethel Mithiane Special School for the Disabled. The boy was named Saturday because he was found on that day. When taken to the hospital for a physical and mental evaluation, one of his legs was broken as he was restrained, which left him with a permanent limp. When it came to his mental health, doctors concluded that he was mentally delayed. Ethel Mithiane, the school's founder, thought otherwise. At school, Ethel worked with him every single day to teach him how to behave like a human being. He was very violent. He beat other boys and destroyed everything that was not food. Teachers weren't sure if they would even communicate accurately with the boy to tame him and wondered if he was even fully human. He acted out unpredictably during his first days, breaking things, climbing equipment, digging holes, and eating raw meat. Mithiane said, quote, When he came to the center, he didn't like blankets. He wanted to sleep naked, and he hated clothing. But now he's improved. He accepts clothes and takes a bath. While he never learned to speak, he could eventually communicate with gestures and grunts, and even learn to walk upright. After a couple of months, he began to interact with other boys, sharing food with them, and trying to communicate. However, almost a decade later, and since he was found, he still behaves more like a monkey, still afraid of humans, 
longing for the wilderness and the jungle. The Putin Photo In 1988, President Ronald Reagan visited Moscow to meet Soviet leader Mikhail Gorbachev. A year later, the Soviet Union would begin to crumble. Berlin would be reunited, and Eastern Europe freed from the communist regime, marking the end of the Cold War. During the visit, Pete Souza, the president's official photographer who would later work for Barack Obama, took a photo of Reagan as he was walking through the streets of the Kremlin. The picture remained unpublished until it surfaced on the web in 2009. It immediately grabbed the attention of the international press. At first glance, the picture appears ordinary. The image shows Reagan shaking hands with many regular Moscow citizens in the Red Square, while Soviet officials stand around in identical gray suits. In the background, the Kremlin can be appreciated looming on the horizon. In a striped shirt and khaki pants, immediately behind the boy, stands a young man with sandy blonde hair and a camera around his neck. A closer look reveals that this mysterious and yet to be officially identified man bears a striking resemblance to Vladimir Putin, the current president of Russia. Putin's press spokesman, Dmitry Peskov, has vehemently denied that the man in the photo was Russia's future head of state. Souza himself, however, has pointed out that the man could be Putin during his youth. He explained that some of the tourists Reagan met when he took the photo were asking oddly pointed questions about his human rights record. It made little sense until a Secret Service agent told him that they were all KGB families. The Putin theory may indeed be true, despite the denials. Putin was serving as a junior spy to the KGB in Dresden, East Germany, when the photo was taken. It's believed that he may have received a particular assignment for Reagan's visit. Silkhenge In 2013, grad student Troy Alexander found something strange attached to a tree at a research center in southern Peru. It was a seemingly organic, two-inch-wide web consisting of a silk dome surrounded by a circular hatched wall made of the same material. Alexander quickly published the photos on social networks, searching for someone who could tell him what the structures were. Curious researchers returned to the Tumbapata Research Center and, in exploring the area, found 40 to 50 similar structures. They were all made out of silk, with two distinctive parts, a tall central tower and a circular fence about six millimeters across. They monitored the webs for days, hoping to catch some kind of activity, but were at first denied any glimpse of the creators. Based on the silk the structures were made from, the team ruled out butterflies, moths, and fungus as the source. The problem was, the team couldn't rule anything in either. Finally, they removed three of the webs from their trees and put them under a microscope for extended observation. After a week, spiderlings began to emerge from the sacks at the center of the webs. Curiously, just one spider hatched per web, a strange abnormality considering most spiders leave behind sacks with at least six eggs contained within. Phil Torres, one of the scientists, said, quote, Traditionally, the female will lay a bunch of eggs, wrap it up very well, sit, and protect it. This is kind of the opposite. Regarding the strange form of the structure used to hatch the egg, Torres explains that one hypothesis is that it's created to protect the egg against the ants that live on the same cecropia trees. Another theory is that the fences are meant to trap easy prey for the baby spiders to have food readily available once they hatch. A more bizarre theory could be that the baby spiders are used as a decoy to lure prey that the female spider can kill once they fall into the trap. Near some of the clusters the scientists found, they spotted corpses of smaller spiders and ants used to camouflage nests. Everything could be possible, as DNA tests have not shown any resemblance to any discovered species. For the time being, this new type of arachnid has been named the Silkhenge spider, in reference to the similarity its webs have to the mysterious Stonehenge rock formation. Altahama, Georgia's own Nessie. In the spring of 2018, Jeff Warren was out on his boat near Wolf Island, Georgia, when he spotted something unusual. On the beach nearby, a heron was picking at the insides of what seemed to be a small, prehistoric-looking animal lying in the sand. Warren snapped a photo of the scene and brought it into town, where locals informed him of the existence of Altahama, or Alti, a reptilian sea creature of local lore described as Georgia's own incarnation of the Loch Ness Monster. It's no coincidence as some of the first people who walked through the waters were Scottish immigrants from the very shores of Loch Ness. 
The creature Warren spotted appears to have fins and appendages like Nessie's, although its size is much smaller. Local shrimp boat captains insist the beast is a myth, attributing sightings to frilled sharks, alligators, and even alligator gars that live in the zone. Other witnesses that have seen the creature have described it with mammal characteristics, for the strange way in which the monster moved its tail while swimming. Still others that have seen it believe the creature is a strange prehistoric era snake. Still, there is no authentic physical evidence of the monster that lurks in the zone. The sightings of the creature date back from the first settlements near the island. Since then, it's been spotted by lumberjacks, boy scouts, journalists, and hunters of mythical creatures. Still, it is ironic to note that the creature began to be seen precisely at the time when Scottish settlers founded the first towns around the area.